Our reading today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 9. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told them, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, no, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. So they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been born blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, Well, how can he perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, He is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know that he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciples. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, 
Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and worshiped him. This is the word of the Lord. All right, that's kind of a longer lesson than usual. So maybe you want to kind of just stand up and go like this, okay, to kind of get yourself ready for the next part. Uh, if you've got a Bible handy, you could, you could take a moment to, uh, while I just babble to go get your Bible. If you want to follow along, we're in John chapter 9. Because I suppose when it's your second to the last sermon, you kind of get to talk about anything you want to, because what are they going to do? Especially when you're talking to an essentially empty sanctuary, and anyone who's going to see it is going to be watching online. So it seems to me there's a few little perks, maybe, uh, about this whole pandemic thing, and one of them is, is the fact that if you get bored during the sermon, you can just like switch the channel instead of having to get up in front of everyone and pretend that you need to go to the restroom really, really bad right now, even though I can see you through the windows at the back of the church heading straight for the donuts. Okay. So if you haven't turned the channel already... Uh, what we're doing is we've been th going through the appointed lessons for the season of Lent, and for this Sunday, it is the story of the blind man that Jesus heals in John chapter 9. And what's typical of Jesus in this miracle is how he just gives the man his sight. He just, bam, drops it on him, doesn't ask permission, doesn't make a big production of it. The guy's just hanging out, minding his own business. When all of a sudden, and he doesn't know who, remember, because he can't see anything, someone has his hands on him, muddy, spitty hands, by the way, and, and he's rubbing his eyes and telling him to go wash, and that would not fly as social distancing. Okay. And it must have been pretty confusing, maybe even threatening, if you're blind and you don't know what is going on. But the guy does, he goes and washes, and suddenly he can see. So Jesus does this pretty incredible thing, but then, if you have your Bibles, you may notice that he, Jesus just kind of fades into the background at this point, okay? Because from verse 8 all the way through verse 34, Jesus isn't even part of the story, all of a sudden, the story veers off into a different direction, and it's all about how people who don't believe this formerly blind guy react and how the man himself stumbles through some pretty uninspiring answers, mostly consisting of differing versions of, beats me, until he finally blurts out at the very end that he believes that Jesus is the Savior but not before he first answers his skeptical neighbors that he doesn't know how he was healed other than that a guy named Jesus rubbed some mud in his eyes, he washed it off, and he could see. Not satisfied, they haul him to the Pharisees who ask the very same questions to, we get, to which he gives the very same response. Although he refers to Jesus now as a prophet where before he referred to him as a man. But the Pharisees, being the Pharisees after all, they bring his parents in, which is probably a little humiliating for a grown man, right? To see what they have to say about their annoying son. Listen, they say, why are you pestering us? He's an adult, leave us alone, ask him. He can speak for himself. So again the Pharisees call the now seen man in to interrogate him, and again his response to how this could be is, I, I, I don't know. All I know is that I was blind. Now I can see. Well, they say, how, 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 how? Tell us how. How did he do it? And I think by this point, the guy is getting a little fed up because he turns a little kind of snarky. I already told you, you won't listen, and yet you're asking me again, 
Maybe it's because you want to be his followers. And of course, they're not going to stand for that. So the Pharisees fall back on their only remaining option. Fake news, fake news, discredit the witness. Why should we listen to you? You were born in sin anyway, fake news. And with that, they bounce the once blind man right out of the temple. Now, in case you didn't spot it for yourself, here's the beautiful irony, okay? In the end, the one person who could not see is now the only one who can see clearly. While those who boast of their ability to see and understand everything now are suddenly, stubbornly determined to preserve their own blindness. And then finally, at the end of the story, Jesus reappears. He asks the man if he believes in the Son of Man. And the guy is still really a little fuzzy in his response until Jesus says, Hey, look, man, it's me. I'm the guy. I'm the Son of Man. And after all the starts and stops and uncertain answers along the way, the guy finally responds with a statement of faith, calls him Lord, he says he believes. Not knowing is an uncomfortable thing. Not having all the answers can be embarrassing or awkward or even crazy-making. Let me give you a personal example. One of the job hazards of being a pastor is that you always end up feeling like everyone expects you to know everything when it comes to the Bible and theology and faith. And I, I'm pretty sure people probably don't actually expect that, but as a pastor, you begin to expect it of yourself. And so you transfer that feeling onto them because you don't want to be a bad pastor. And you want to look like you napped all the way through seminary, even if maybe you did or that they should go to someone else because you don't have a clue. Now, the truth is, the real truth is my mind does not work like a scriptural Google search engine. I'm not wired that way. And sometimes that embarrasses me. I can't tell you how often someone over the years has asked me for a Bible verse for their situation, and my first reaction is panic. Panic. Because after all these years, it still takes only an instant for me to begin to wonder, what if I can't come up with one? What if I remember one, but I can't think of his chapter and verse? I'm a pretty lame excuse for a pastor. I've always wished I was better at this, especially because I don't know is not a very satisfying answer. And yet it seems to be the only answer we have these days. Now, in the age of COVID-19, pretty much all it seems we've got left anymore is uncertainty. And I don't know. Everything else feels like it's been taken from us. I'm supposed to be finishing my time here in about a month and then going up to Washington to be with Barbie after eight months of being separated from each other. But Am I going to get to do that right now? I don't know. Depends on if the borders are closed. All of us who are retired or about to retire are watching our retirement funds disappear like flash paper, going up in a sudden burst of flame. Will I have enough to left to live on after all of this is over? I don't know. How long will the schools be closed? I don't know. How long until we can gather together again in our sanctuary as a community of faith? I don't know. How long before there's anything worth buying in the grocery store? I don't know, but I will tell you that I'm not so desperate yet as to hoard anything from the vegan shelves, though it's not surprising to see plenty of that stuff left. How long before things get back to normal? I don't know. Will they ever get back to, norther, to, to, to normal? I, I don't know that either. To one degree or another, many of us have been demoralized as wave after wave after wave uncertainty has crashed against everything we knew and were used to and counted on like giant surf against a cracking, crumbling jetty. The virus itself remains a bundle of uncertainty. And all that uncertainty and not knowing makes it hard to remain calm. 
giving rise to all sorts of what-ifs, which generally are not our friends at a time like this, but they show up at the doorstep of our brains anyway, like uninvited guests who want to move in and eat our food and mess up our bathroom. When everything we're used to is threatened or disappears, we tend to resort to fear as our only other option. I don't know. It's a devastating answer, the shattering refrain of our days. So how do we live with the certainty of uncertainty? How do we hold on to life and faith when everything we know, everything we thought we could count on is turned inside out and upside down and nothing makes any sense anymore? I think maybe this unnamed blind man has the key, and it's remarkably, unexpectedly simple. What's interesting here, what I want you to notice is the interplay between what the man knows, what he doesn't know, and what he comes to believe. The same refrain keeps playing through this story. I don't know how he did it, said the newly seen blind man, but one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. I don't know whether he is good or bad, but one thing I do know, he gave me sight. I don't know if he's the Messiah, I don't even know what that means, but one thing I do know, he's opened my eyes and banished the eternal night in which I lived turns out that it is not about what you know, it is about who you know and who you trust. Not about the verses you can rattle off or the theological minutia you can quote, but about recognizing what Jesus has done for you. It's taken me years to realize that being a person of faith, or even a pastor for that matter, does not necessarily equate to being the guy with all the answers. 1 Peter 3.15 is a passage I quote often, and it says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But I don't necessarily think that means you have to be the answer person. I don't have a problem giving the reason for the hope that I have. His name is Jesus. He's the reason for my hope. He's bigger than me. He's kinder than me. He's more reliable than me. He's wiser than me. Plus, he's the son of God who beat up death. He's my reason. It's Jesus Always Jesus, only Jesus. There are so many things I don't understand about God, so many things that don't make sense to me. After years of seminary training and pastoral ministry, I still don't understand why some people get sick, pray for recovery, and still die while others get well again. I don't know why some people seem to have more luck than they know what to do with, while others seem destined to slog from one crisis to the next. Half the time, I don't get what God is up to, and the other half, I think I know, and then I turn out to be wrong. But I know this. Jesus is the most compassionate, merciful, strongest, most dynamic person I have ever known. He is fine-tuned to the hurts and hopes, the anger and the love, the disappointments and the delights, the sorrow and the joy that all mix themselves together in the complex stew that defines who I am. He knows the darkness through which I walk. He's forgiven me when I had nothing to bring into His presence but guilt. He's loved me when I was so disappointed with myself that I could not understand how anyone could love me or why anyone should. He's put up with me when I have whined like a toddler, when I've stamped my foot and demanded my way, when I've been lazy in my response to Him, when I've doubted His reality and challenged His Lordship. There have been times when He's been silent and I wish He would speak, and other times when He has spoken and I have not been listening. Times when he has been mysterious and hidden and difficult to understand and times when he's been as obvious to me as my own skin. 
There are a lot of things I don't know. And so much I don't understand. But I know this. He has never, ever walked away from me. And he will not do so now. That was this man's answer, as simple and uncomplicated as it was. It was his witness, which grows stronger throughout the story and more pronounced every time he shared it. One thing I do know, and that's how I think we get through this time. I think that's our response as people of faith. No, we don't have all the answers, and we're finding our way through this like everyone else. And we're having to improvise as a church. And we're having to figure out what this new life looks like, at least for now. And there's so many things we don't know, and sometimes the fear and anxiety that we clutch to our heart can make it impossible to hold on to Jesus instead and make it feel like we're blind and have lost our sight. But then Jesus rubs our eyes with mud he's made from his own saliva and we can see again. To quote a devotion I shared with the staff the other day and that I included in my recent email to you, wash your hands, yes, but also trust in the one who's washed you into his body in the waters of baptism. Buy what you need at the grocery store, but also trust in the one who has bought you with the price of his blood. Pray for all the medical staff who are caring for the physical needs of your neighbors, but also trust in the great physician of soul and body who chastens and heals. I don't know, said the man, but one thing I do know so I guess it's okay sometimes to say, I don't know, to feel uncertain at times. If everything were easy to understand and I could figure it all out for myself, then I wouldn't need Jesus. But I do. I need him. He's my answer. And I'm content to let him sort all the rest of it out.